Welcome everyone to the Canadian Herpetological Society's Herpetological Hangouts for March the 17th, 2021. My name is Pamela Rutherford. I'm an associate professor at Brandon University in Manitoba, and I'm currently president of the Canadian Herpetological Society. Before we get started with today's talk, I'd like to let you know about our next speaker in our series. Her name is Robin Maritz. She'll be coming to us from the University of Western Cape in South Africa. And she'll be talking to us about reptile ecology in the era of social media. The talk will be aired live on Wednesday, April the 14th at noon Eastern, and then posted on our YouTube channel. I'll now turn things over to Hannah McCurdy Adams, who is going to introduce today's speaker. Hello and welcome everyone uh, to our Herp Hangout. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to share a bit about myself, my heritage and recognize the ancestral history of Canada. I grew up in Ontario, surrounded by rivers in the escarpment. My parents are Geraldine Adams and Edward McCurdy and my ancestors emigrated to Canada from Europe. I wanna pay my respects to many nations, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee, and Métis nations who were the first keepers of where I grew up as a child. Today we are meeting virtually coast to coast to coast across Canada, and I'd like to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. As herpetologists, our natural lands and the animals within them are so important to us. This recognition is a renewal of our commitment as a society to listening to and cherishing the traditional knowledge that Indigenous peoples have of Canada's rep reptiles and amphibians. I also wanna welcome any international participants we have today, including our speaker, and the experience and heritage they bring with them. So welcome everyone. And today we're going to hear from Tom, Lang Tom Langton, who works for the Road Ecology Services branch of the Herptofauna Co Consultants International Limited. Um, and he'll be talking to us about his work with the Western Transportation Institute of Montana State University and the USGS Western Ecological Research Center, among others. Um, and he's talking about reducing road impacts on amphibians and reptiles in California. So go ahead, Tom. Good, okay. Well, this program um, was a five year state of practice investigation instigated by Harold Hunt. Uh, who's now retired at the Office of Materials and Infrastructure at Caltrans offices in Sacramento. And it was a joint collaboration between the Western Ecological Research Center in the US Geological Survey in San Diego and the Western Transport Institute, uh, which is a department of the College of Engineering in Montana State University, based at Bozeman. Um, I'm a conservation ecologist and my small company was invited by Dr. Tony Clevenger, who's very well known and respected around the world in road ecology to work in partnership with MSU and USGS. Uh, and this was, this was partly to provide input and knowledge exchange regarding some of the developments in Europe where I've based, uh, based in England. And I've worked on road ecology issues as part of my work uh, since 1984 on road passages and barrier systems, principally for amphibians and reptiles. I've also had some involvement in the northeast coast of uh, the US since the first salamander passage. Passages were installed at Amherst in Massachusetts in the late 1980s. Um, and here, here we see um, members of the project team uh, with Caltrans staff at an early meeting around 2015, I think. Harold Hunt is second left. Uh, next, standing next to Cheryl Bramey from USGS, who spearheaded, really spearheaded the research uh, program, working with uh, Robert Fisher, who's the, who's the guy in the middle in grey, uh, down at the Western Ecological Research Centre. And um, the Office of Materials and Infrastructure in uh, Caltrans um, comes under the Division of Research, Innovation and System Information. Uh, and they really wanted to know, to get into uh, amphibian and reptile 
um, mitigation passages, um, linkage restoration, all these kind of issues, starting really from scratch. And a number of people, including Amy Bailey, Amy Golden, and Luz Quinnell at Caltrans, are just some of the, the many people who've helped make this happen. And it's been a really great pleasure to work with them, a large team of biologists, uh, engineers, planners, and also to enjoy the Californian sunshine, um, Calmex cuisine, of course, and the hospitality of these great folks. So I've had a really great time working on this project. And um, 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 we've got um, a lot of people to thank. I won't go too much into this. Neil Hetherington at uh, WTI Bozeman did a really great job making up the graphics and uh, the layout for the best management practices uh, guidelines, which is um, which is um, a really important element, turning my sort of clumsy sketches into neat illustrations. What I'm gonna do is just briefly outline um, some of the findings of the program that has led to recommendations for best practice. Much of this is quite generic and will need a degree of interpretation for each site that you may come across and the species characteristics. Um, obviously much of what I'm going to say today relates to railway as, as much as uh, road, roadways. So the seven, the, um, the initial five-year program was um, stretched to seven years in the end in order to complete research experiments and to enable writing up. Um, and really there were six main stages over that period. Um, stakeholder consultations and awareness, existing system structures, inspections, going out to look at the places where passages and fences have been placed, road risk assessment, all of these stages I'll describe. Uh, this is really the makeup of this talk is describing these ver the various processes, a literature review, extending to the world literature, uh, research investigations, which was, as I said, spearheaded by USGS, and then finally, the best management practice guidelines, which um, will be available from this Friday, 19th of March, on the Caltrans uh, website. So stakeholder um, consultation and awareness. We um, held some early... Um, well, prior to the project, actually, USGS organized a workshop in San Diego to look at some of the issues in Southern California and to begin the process of consulting people actually involved in the day-to-day -day road wildlife conflict issues. Uh, There's also a webinar in Sacramento uh, for wildlife staff and engineers that focused on construction materials, what you actually use to build um, these structures and reviewing their benefits and disbenefits in relation to cost, durability and performance. We reached out to the academics and other biologists and naturalists more widely, for example, attending the Declining Amphibian Populations Task Force for California and Nevada Working Group and uh, Desert Tortoise Council, receiving some very useful advice and feedback. So over the 2014 to 2020 period, uh, we presented and attended at the Biennial International Conferences of ICOET and IENI. Um, IENI is the European uh, equivalent of the North, of the, uh, North American ICOET uh, conference, looking for communications and infrastructure impact and remediation uh, issues. And this enabled the work to be discussed at uh, uh, presented and and posters were, were put to to uh, to increase communications and there was a notable interest from countries in Asia um, with large road programs both citing a lack of guidance um, that might be fulfilled by the or assisted by the BMP the final output of the program um, stakeholder advice and participation uh, more locally. Uh, obviously, a number of government bodies have been involved. 
uh, not-for-profit organizations, extremely useful with advice, experiences, contacts, manufacturers and suppliers of um, passages and barriers, um, uh, all helped in some way donating product or showing us around sites we didn't know about. Um, so I had a great amount of buy-in from, from those stakeholders and obviously ecological consultants and academics involved in uh, hands-on studies of the systems were extremely uh, important in actually fulfilling the, the goal of the project. Uh, for those of you who don't know California herpetology that well, this is a left-hand side is a map of the species. Um, uh, it's a heat map, really, I suppose, of the 166 or so taxa showing overlap of, of up to uh, 32 taxons in the southwest as you head down towards Biocalifornia Peninsula, which is a part of New Mexico. And you can see right down in that, that red uh, 23 to 32 species area is, um, is where San Diego is. Um, and um, quite a high density, a really high density of species compared with the north, for example, places where they're under the yellow coloring donates um, one to seven species. The right hand map is an example of the um, one of the ways in which the distribution of herpetofauna can be looked at in relation to both uh, state roads, the, the Caltrans major roads uh, with lots of traffic and identified corridor areas, which are places of most concern where the state program for retaining biological connectivity between ecosystems is a main aim. So the green overlay is, uh, the, the red shows up on the, where the green overlay crosses the species range. That's another good way of focusing in on potential uh, places where work can be done. So stage two was looking at um, the herb crossings that have been built so far. And we found through various researches, there were six target species. Often the protective legislation had triggered um, the finance and the need for the, for the project. Um, there's one reptile, the desert tortoise, um, and this shows a, a new concrete culvert built under State Route 58, uh, the Hinkley Highway Realignment Project in Caltrans District 8. That's uh, the main desert roads are often four lanes, so they're quite wide, making for long dark passages and designed obviously for, for carrying uh, drainage water, but increasingly now being considered for wildlife passage two. Typically these are joined steel mesh fencing with riprap rock, uh, you can see in the picture. Um, but uh, the riprap rock is, is put there to, to reduce scouring in the in extreme flow. And uh, the problem, one of the problems is that rocks can trap uh, shelled animals, Chilonians, if they get their shells wedged between them, trying to walk over them. So this is another issue being looked at. And there are at least four places with culverts and barriers studied, including those uh, looked at by William Borman and others in the 1980s when some of the earlier research was carried out. Um, this, this is a quick map I did for this talk showing distribution of passage and barrier sites in California. So we're looking now mainly at the sort of um, central California, a uh, bit of, uh, and further south. Uh, many of the systems are in a sort of grouped around San Francisco uh, and uh, in the Bay Area and near the edge of the Great Central Valley uh, with the two sites near Modesto, um, Caltrans districts four, five and 10, I think. The desert tortoise, Passages and barriers are focused in the Mojave Desert, District 8, 
Um, there's a group of concrete culverts along Route I-15. You can see there with the arrows, it's not exactly the location, but there's, there's multiple passages along there that are known to be used by tortoises. There's a couple by um, just north of Barstow there. And the dotted line kind of shows a, a, a rough desert area where there are uh, desert, uh, tortoise fencing placed in many, many locations. Uh, not probably studied very much, but they're there. And the Western Toad, there's a couple of, um, um, there's a Western Toad site at Davis, close to Sacramento, that's the top triangle. Uh, that was built in 1995, the first one, and that was rather experimental, never really functioned properly. But that gives you a rough idea of the places we went to look to find out what had been built and try and find out what happened to how well the systems worked, etc. Um, this is a indication of a couple of sites. Um, um, for amphibians, on the uh, left is one uh, is uh, one of three passages at Lake Lagunitas uh, for California tiger salamander with a breeding pond close to the um, to the road. There's Junipero Serra Freeway next to Stanford University, uh, who gave us a lot of help between. This is really between San Francisco and uh, San Jose. And as you see, that's a surface passage with a slotted polymer concrete uh, top, which was found to be the most common application. Um, and there were actually 31 of these kinds of passages uh, within about a quarter of the 13 amphibian sites. These are termed micro passages under a meter span where the passage remains wet during rainfall and uh, you can see a wood shutter barrier alongside and a simple deflection board which is actually not quite in place that, that needs straightening out and this is one of the usgs study sites where cheryl bramer and michael hobbs of hobbs ecology have been doing camera studies uh, it is really technical advances in camera uh, use that are driving better studies that reduce costs more and more every year as, as they get better and better. To the right here um, is Ventana Way Seascape Upland Santa Cruz County near San Jose also built in 1999. And this is a system of five surface passages, an injected mold, plastic, one-way barrier. You can see there for Santa Cruz long toad salamander. This site was actually subject to critical evaluation by uh, Mark Alabax and David Labs around 10 years ago in the transactions of the Western section of the Wildlife Society, which usefully raised many of the design and monitoring issues that became a focus of, of our study. Here are a few more amphibian sites at the top again for tiger salamander and 12 passage system here at Winford, Wilfred Avenue. Grayton Resort and Casino, which is um, also using surface drain channels built in 2014, uh, partly as mitigation for uh, building of a casino. You can just see on the back right hand side. Um, this has an unusual arrangement of surface passages joined to the fields on one side with elevated plastic pipes spanning a ditch. So, and there's is. Um, uh, the land habitat has been converted to agriculture, um, which is a problem. There doesn't seem to be much breeding or terrestrial habitat left. I'll be interested to know to hear from anyone who knows this location anymore. You can see there's some, uh, the, the fence is a bit short on the top right, drawing the, the grass is overgrowing the, the, the barrier and the entrance to the pipe. Um, I'm not quite sure what they used there, but. Um, it's a very unusual design. Um, bottom left, not too far away, is a three passage system at Stony Point near Cotati. Uh, Santa Rosa built with Caltrans funding around 2013. Uh, these, this site has steel pipes 
uh, with a range of different fences studied by Tracy Bain at Sonoma State University, who showed the steel pipes were used to some extent by tiger salamanders, as well as arboreal salamander and frogs, frog species. And um, the report, as ever, often here this suggested a longer period of study was needed to better understand the use of the system. Finally, bottom right is one of 11 surface drains used, passages used at a, at a California tiger salamander site at Portola Avenue, Livermore in Alameda County, with buried mesh and solid polypropylene barrier flat against the road. And uh, over the period of the study, we were also able to look at systems elsewhere in North America, um, and in Europe, Hungary, Poland, Netherlands, and Germany uh, to look at uh, new developments in those countries. Okay, um, on a different scale, um, we located a number of projects um, here in Pacifica, a place called the Devil's uh, Slide, is sort of the, the other end of the extreme with um, with roads being taken away from wildlife by drilling holes. You can see the, as usual, Highway 1 is crumbling into the sea and um, the road was punched through the hill, preventing a long winding road over it, which um, massively reduced the impact. Uh, this was a site with um, a red-legged frog and um, Californian red-legged frog and San Francisco garter snake. Uh, Another similar situation at Caldecott Tunnel um, near Oakland, District 4, 3,300 foot tunnel, uh, preventing damage to the East Bay Regional Park, the Cal very important Caldecott Wildlife Corridor. So all these, these top end solutions really are what you're looking for to really take the road impact away from the habitat as much as you possibly can. Stage three of the project was endangered species, uh, endangered species focus um, and road risk assessments. Again, this was a USGS part of the project using a range of life history traits, the um, physiological and behavioral parameters, such as daily and seasonal movement patterns in particular, and so fecundity, age to maturation, were taken into account to give a score for each species. And this is published paper you can uh, get online, I think. Um, and what this showed was that all of the Chelonians, 100% of the four, there's only four species were highly vulnerable to uh, road mortality and also snakes. Snakes in California seem to be in a bad way as a result of roads. Um, a lot of them are, uh, able and, and often moving quite long distances. Also the toads, um, there's a good number of toads in California, 11 species, and two thirds of those featured as, um, as highly vulnerable or uh, very high risk or risk, uh, high risk from road impacts. And just very quickly, just to give you some brief examples of um, the kind of species involved for each species group. So um, you can come, you can look at these later if the uh, presentation's online, but um, you know, three or four species typically from each group falling into the very high risk or high risk category. So this is the toad, frogs and salamanders, and then turtles and tortoises, lizards, some of the lizards vulnerable, um, either because they have small home ranges mostly because they have small home ranges with, uh, uh, and are rare. Uh, um, um, well, not necessarily small home ranges, but, but certainly they're, they're rare and, uh, and highly vulnerable, slow moving, crossing roads or avoiding crossing roads completely. And again, the snakes, the, the large number of snakes in the high risk and high risk categories reflected by longer longer lists of, of animals. Fourthly uh, was the literature review. Um, obviously, uh, we needed to look at everything that had been done and um, 
um, two books published in 2015, um, helped a lot because a lot of the work had been done for, for those. Um, guidelines, 2016 guidelines, BMP for Ontario, of course, Carrie Gunson uh, worked on that and a lot of uh, good information there. And uh, very many uh, English, some other languages, Germany, particularly Germany, Austria, Switzerland, got a lot of publications are needing a bit of translation uh, to provide the background knowledge to refer to. Uh, so 52 studies, 125 taxa, uh, again, the groupings, uh, giving plenty of variety, plenty of different needs and behavioral traits to consider. Um, okay. Um, with impacts, the, the similar effects found in other fauna in, in the road effect zone. Uh, obviously apply um, a lot of mortality on the roads if you don't do anything um, leading possibly to extinction um, this is described in the literature with not surprisingly amphibians influenced by water supply and water quality issues and both amphibians and reptiles suffering where vital components of their range uh, such as breeding, feeding, and refuging uh, are damaged, destroyed, or bisected by roads. And at the, uh, both the small and smallest and largest scales, attention to detail is really essential in, in getting these passages to work. Levels of light and, uh, play a role with many species, and, the, and darkness, obviously, for those that move at night. Airflow speed and direction influences temperature considerably. Um, water flow and wetness is often critical for amphibians that simply refuse to move on dry substrates or prefer not to. And passage-based substrates and cover items may also dictate the rejection rate or turnaround of animals when they actually do get into and start to explore passages. Um, the research element of the project, stage five, um, uh, you've already seen the, the, the road risk assessment analysis. Um, also, the SGS did spatial mapping of um, California essential habitat, connectivity lands, highways, and high risk species. And in the BMP, you will see at the back there are maps for species groups, is, um, uh, and uh, uh, you can refer to the distribution of different uh, types of animals. And they also carried out quite an extensive um, study of the movement of um, tiger salamanders and uh, the effectiveness of barrier uh, turnarounds. Um, look at uh, barrier opacity, what the material is made of and how easy it is to see through it. And uh, a novel elevated road segment prototype, which I'll, I'll explain in a, in a second. So I'll just quickly have a look at these things. Uh, the work was, as I said, coordinated by, done and coordinated by Cheryl Bruno. So this is Stamford near uh, San Jose. And uh, it's a great example of returning to a built system to pick up on performance using a new multiple camera system with time recording designed by Michael Hobbs. Hobbs. It was found that the California tiger salamanders moved twice as fast along solid rather than mesh fencing. And um, while some salamanders gave up before reaching the passage, once the passage entrance was located, around nine out of 10 salamanders went through a full crossing. Well, this is about a 14 meter uh, passage, I think. Um, there were several salamanders that headed straight for the passages without encountering fences, which may be consistent with following olfactory trails or even learned direction. So um, this great new system um, designed by Michael Hobbs has been really um, helpful in discovering some new things that are actually quite an old site. And hopefully that will continue. Um, these research, these research uh, questions are important because the length of time an animal is prepared to go along a fence will influence the probability of finding a passage entrance. 
um, hence the European recommendation for steeper angles as passages get further apart. This model for behavior needs testing uh, for different species, but um, as passages cost a lot of money to build and so do barriers, um, and as passages get further apart, um, um, here on this illustration, 230 feet, then um, the fence length is maximized. And look at, but look how much uh, habitat becomes redundant. So um, you've got to be, uh, you've got to really look carefully at what you're doing. Um, as the passages come closer together, the angle reduces to being flat and parallel to the road. Passages are more expensive to build than barriers, but barriers require a lot of maintenance. The Stanford design had a natural alignment of about 20 degrees uh, in one direction. So all these things need some, a lot of careful thought. They're not necessarily settled, uh, particularly for different species, they, they will vary. Um, uh, look at, uh, USGS also looked at turns, turnarounds at the Rancho Jamal Ecological Reserve east of San Diego, and results suggested that the turnarounds should be formed in smooth curves, not angular ones, and that they should be up to between 6 and 15 feet in length, 6 feet wide, tapering slightly back towards the main fence. And these designs were shown to enable 90% uh, of individuals. Uh, in that case, uh, as you can see, there's a toad there, uh, snakes and lizards. The, the toad is going back along the fence. The, the snake is, the rattlesnake is going out back towards habitat. Um, so again, nine out of 10 will turn back in the direction of origin. And a curved secondary uh, fence as shown in the illustration is recommended to catch those that do uh, turn back and that may overshoot the, the, the fencing. Um, another area they looked at were at Rancho Jamal as well is uh, using test enclosures and cameras was to look at around about a couple of hundred reptiles, uh, I think mainly from uh, 19 species towards different types of fencing and the amount of hesitation, probing and climbing along different fences and time it took animals to pass each fence. And it was, um, the particular point here is that the more transparent uh, and opener fences, the more time the animals spend trying to get through it, as opposed to a solid barrier that they can't see or smell through, uh, which they walk, pass twice as quickly. So there's a major finding here in terms of uh, the kind of fencing that uh, could be used to best effect. Obviously, these are important considerations where stress, dehydration, even death at a fence can be caused by animals being trapped behind them. So that's a really important one. Are you still with me? Yep, we can hear you now. Great, okay. Um, Stephanie Barnes and others from the US Forest Service uh, High Sierra Ranger District helped with a, an experimental low bridge made out of solid timber. Um, the aim was to look at lower cost and more sustainable types of crossing structure. This is a two lane system, um, again, using the HALT cameras uh, by, uh, um, designed by Michael Hobbs. The um, system was used by three other amphibians, in, in addition to the target of Yosemite toad, including Pacific tree frog, five reptiles, including mountain guard snake and rubber burr, and a number of mammals, including huge numbers of mice and rats and long-tailed weasel, yellow bellied marmot. So initial uh, discoveries on this type of passage uh, appear to be very good, and that's going to be subject to further investigation. Um, moving on quickly, um, the outcome of one of the outcomes of the program has been to categorize. I'm not really going to have time to, we lost about 10 minutes at the start. I don't have time to go through these very much. So I'll skip through. Uh, obviously, there are some really fancy purpose made amphibian bridges, ponds at each end. So it's kind of designer amphibian overpass. Um, we have a 
project being proposed at the um, first major overpass planned at Liberty Canyon on the busy US 101, um, which is also the known as the Hollywood Ventura Freeway. This is to rejoin habitat between the Santa Monica and Sierra Madre Mountains near uh, Liberty Canyon in the Angura Hills. This is a model, it's not the real thing. Um, there's a lot of work being done to try and make it happen. Target species is actually mountain lion, but at least three species of snake considered high or very high road risk, including coach whipped striped racer and western rattlesnake may benefit from the connectivity of the overpasses constructed. So that's quite excited as will be California's first major wildlife overpass. Um, again, the smaller categorization goes to the smaller underpasses. Uh, this is a picture of an adult garter snake, snake using a type three structure on state 152 on the Panchero Pass Highway near Gilroy. And uh, you can also see a small group of quail there alongside the snake, which is quite nice. And you can also see the use of rocks and trees to provide a natural environment. Um, this this uh, passage is no doubt three foot deep of, of torrential uh, water flow at some times of the year, but much time of the year it's dry. So um, these, these all sorts of passages can be used and are used by different species. Uh, right down to the smaller culverts now, uh, the tens of thousands of them um, that aren't uh, purpose made for amphibians. Um, we have the ones that are micro passages that are purpose made for amphibians. But there are, there are many, very many kind of water, small water pipes that can be um, eroded away and of little use for fauna passage, but with a little repair work can be brought back into use. And um, this includes places, for example, here where Fritilla's yellow leg frog can avoid crossing main roads. And you can see in the drawing, there's a quite, you just need to build back the um, the erosion with earth or concrete, and uh, you, you may well be helping a good number of uh, animals and maybe even a population. Um, stage six was obviously the construction of the technical guidance manual. I've really not got too much time to go into this in any detail. It may well be that I can do another recording and post it, um, going through this more slowly. Um, I'm kind of running out of time if I'm going to have some questions. But um, one of the major questions is how big the passage should be. And basically, we haven't said exactly how big, but we've given recommendations for a minimum size. And uh, when you look at the BMP, you can see that different shapes and sizes and different widths of roads make for different size recommendations. Um, most most of all, uh, in uh, with regards to um, uh, effectiveness and performance of systems is the ability to study them and to go back and to make changes that will improve their use. It's no good doing a sort of fit and forget. You have to um, really make sure that the really the project starts when you get the first data back from the first years of the tunnels and passages use. And then you say, how, you know, how, how does this reflect what we knew before? How well is it working? What can we do to make it better? And so really the start of the project, the, the, the end of the construction is really, in some senses, the start of the project, not the end of it. Um, this is a kind of idealized passage with a little bit of water, a little bit of um, land. There's a gap in the medium where the light comes through. Um, so that could also be big enough for, for a wide range of fauna. Um, again, um, I haven't got time, but I can go through the types of passages that we've got. We've got the smallest slotted passages and gratings. We've got the adapted culverts, which are steel and concrete. Uh, still passages without foundations, which have a natural substrate base. Uh, closed culverts where moisture has been added with pipes or a channel. 
And of course, with barriers, um, um, this shows a deflector board made out of steel um, on a stilt tunnel. Um, and um, barriers are obviously as important a component as the passage in the system. You have barrier heights, which vary for different species. Um, some of the frogs and long lakes require quite high fences to operate effectively. Some barriers require overhangs. Again, it depends on the species. Um, and obviously, if you use the height of the barrier may relate to the type of barrier material that you use. There's some uh, barriers are more climbable than others, obviously. And um, so those all need to be factored in. You have the difference between a guide wall and a fence is the guide walls are usually more solid and built in. There are um, often built on embankments with dirt to fill the gap and uh, the heavy foundations. These can be brick, breeze block, or um, even steel, cast concrete. And they, they're a permanent fixture that uh, shouldn't need too much maintenance. Uh, there are also one-way fences uh, that are freestanding, and these have backfill and enable animals to get off the road or move from one side without hindrance. Uh, these are made out of injection mold, plastic, or folded um, polypropylene. And we shouldn't mistake the temporary mesh fencing used to in exclusion projects. Uh, this type of mesh fencing isn't really durable enough to last more than a few years. And so uh, this is being used to exclude animals from an area that's going to be developed. But these aren't really useful for any kind of road permanent structure, as they will get damaged maybe by snow, snow plows. Um, and, and they will go brittle and rip uh, more easily than some of the more robust materials. It's very important to recognize that barrier materials are prone to expansion. They can crack and they need to have expansion joints in them. And also, for example, on the bottom left, there's a, a zinc plated galvanized steel fence uh, where you will get zinc residues trapping around. Um, all the fences and barriers eventually erode, drop the particulates into the soil and are a form of pollution. So you need to be mindful of that when you're designing and thinking about effect. There are also side road passages to help keep animals going onto roads through from, from side roads. Um, jump outs. Are often very important and shade shelters in particular. We're finding that tortoises can die uh, along the lengths of, of, of fences tra trapped by heat exhaustion. Um, and also jump outs, they need to be designed in such a way that they don't trap the necks and bodies of larger animals. So if you're using a jump out, which is um, not like this log jump out, where the animals can climb freely up the logs and over the, to the other side, but the cone, you can't quite see it on the, on the drawing here, but uh, in, the, in the photograph at the bottom, but uh, those that are formed in fences out of cones need to be made in such a way that they don't snare animal, other animals, non-target species. Monitoring, of course, is the lifeblood of these projects. You have to use, there's a lot of good um, uh, technology out there now, cameras, uh, DNA, radio tracking, uh, there's, a, there's an urgent need to identify the um, size of the populations, their movements and distribution before the uh, construction and to set clear criteria for success that you use afterwards uh, to judge whether your project has been successful, whether it's getting a large number of animals through uh, to a breeding site or whether it's a small number to satisfy um, population viability, um, which can be one animal per generation time. So success criteria doesn't necessarily mean a large number of animals. It can mean enough animals to make sure there's no genetic drift and isolation caused by the road. 
and that will depend on a wide range of circumstances, including the types of habitats either side of the road, where the substitute habitat can be built, and um, uh, many other factors that need to be taken into consideration before you decide something has worked or hasn't worked. I'm going to stop there. There's, there's some more information on crossing system maintenance. There's retrofitting where you can build gabion baskets to form ledges along uh, streams. Uh, you can build side passages and ledges. These are being used already for, for mammals. Uh, you can simply just move riprack from under a bridge to form paths. Obviously, with all these, you need to consult engineers so that the principal purpose isn't compromised. But forming easy paths for small animals to move along, uh, even fencing along some of these existing bridges can be potentially very beneficial. And retrofitting amphibian and reptile barriers to mammal crossings, mammals being better at finding crossings sometimes than, than other species, is another opportunity that's highlighted in the best practice manual. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there. And um, again, you can come back and look at the credits. So I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, take it. Hopefully, there's a bit of time for questions. Yes, thanks, Tom. There is a bit of time. And we do have a couple questions so far. If you have others, you can put them in the chat. If you'd like to raise your hand too, we can uh, unmute you and you can ask them verbally. But I'll start with a question from Tara. Um, have any of the fencing studies looked at how water flow is impacted by a solid fence versus a mesh fence? Yes, that's a big issue in fence construction. Uh, you need to, and it's covered in the BMP, you can either place um, stone filled trenches underneath the fence that act as a sump to take water underneath so you don't get backing up and waterlogging, or you can drill perforations in the barrier below ground. But I think my experience over the years is that dig a trench, maybe a foot or two foot deep and wide every, I don't know, there's a recommendation here, I think it's every 30 feet or something, depending on how much water is, how long the slope is, how much water there is. And that will, that should, that goes under the fence and out the other side and should carry um, most uh, water flows uh, rainfall, maybe you might need a um, uh, allowance for extreme flows, but in most situations, that kind of um, provision will stop uh, waterlogging and slumping and all the other problems associated with uh, preventing natural water flow through the top star. Oh, thank you. And then David has a question, a couple of questions. Um, has the research on the California tiger salamander um, moving faster? Oh, the, the research about it moving faster along a solid barrier versus a mesh fence been published? Yeah, sorry, I didn't get to say that, but um, the research volume is all, is a beautiful report. It's going to be on the Caltrans site this Friday. I strongly recommend you you download it for free, as with the BMP um, guidance manual. So it'll all be there, and uh, great detail on on these studies. So um, yeah, you can follow that up from this talk. Thank you, and I might I might get that link from you again. I didn't get it quick enough, and we can send it out in an email. Sure. For those that well, were wanting it, uh, you've got the um, Patricia has the the um, uh, PowerPoint, so you can take it off there or I can email it to you. Perfect, Never mind then. All right, and then we know these structures are expensive, so how are they being funded? Well, most times they're triggered by um, various funds within Caltrans. Um, sometimes the um, uh, private companies will pay for them uh, if it's part of a mitigation package involving, say, a solar energy project or something like that. And sometimes folk just get together and decide they're going to raise the money through a crowdfund or uh, something like that. So there's many, many different ways. And uh, according to whether you're, whether you're trying to put something or you're going to minimize damage or you're trying to proactively recreate a linkage, 
Uh, I think the Liberty Canyon one is being promoted by nonprofits, but it's going to cost a lot of money and there's going to be a lot of organizations putting into it. So it's just really uh, you need energy and enthusiasm and drive. And uh, those those re those link relinking projects are some of the most exciting ones, I think. Yeah, and I, I think I heard recently something exciting that the US federal government actually put in funding for wildlife crossings into a, a somewhat recent budget. Timing is a bit fuzzy this year, but um, lots of- yeah, I think it's growing. I think, I think um, you know, people need to write in and promote it, but I think the more and more the, the impact of roads and roads and rail are one of some of the most damaging things you can do to a landscape. And uh, there's a real need, and, and if you get into it and really look, there's, there are opportunities to uh, do some really interesting research, get involved in practical projects, actually uh, study, while, study while something's actually benefiting the environment. And uh, yeah, there's, there's federal and state funds available if you go look for them. So I uh, encourage everyone to do that. Thank you. Um, and I've seen, thank you, Pam. We'll share the link to the Caltrans website on the CHS webpage um, and put in the links for all of our Herp Hangout talks are also posted on the CHS webpage. And we do have a couple more questions, but we're coming up to the hour. So Tom, are you okay to stay for a couple more yeah, minutes? Yeah, sure. I've got, I've got another uh, 20 minutes if you need it. Thank you. Yes, I, I, we may not take the full 20, but let's start with Stephanie's question. Um, do you have any recommendations for multi-species assemblages with differing passage preferences, like, for example, snakes and salamanders? Well, yeah, for sure. Um, a lot of the time, these passages have been designed for single species solutions, which isn't ideal because, obviously, the more species that you're using, the better. What people have found actually, including Katie Pagnuko at, uh, in, in uh, Waterton in, in uh, um, help me here, um, what, uh, Columbia, is it? Yeah, no, anyway, Waterton. Um, she found- Alberta. You know, Alberta, that's the, thank you. Um, she, uh, she found very many other species using a passage and in fact, um, you know, you, usually for even for some of these small micro passages, they're being used by uh, 20 or 30 different species. Uh, the extent to which they're being used isn't always clear, but uh, I mean, biggest is probably better in as much as we'd all like to have a 120 foot overpass um, in every circumstance, but that's just not practical. And uh, so I think the the width of the road is a very important factor because, uh, and, the, and the traffic volumes. But uh, yeah, if you can design for as many species as possible, that's ideal. It's not of, often that an engineer will allow you, necessarily an engineer will allow you to do that, but best practice pushes for it. So especially if your habitat is uh, part of a linkage or there are other reasons for making the passage uh, basically larger so that a greater number of animals will use it, then obviously that is better. And that is a direction which the legislation doesn't drive too well at the moment, it tends to focus in on the rare species and the declining species. But all of the, all of the, all of the techniques in the BMP apply to all of the species. We've had comments of people saying, well, actually, we've got a absolute massacre of of a very common species or, or, or a species that is still quite widespread but declining fast and we need to do something about that it's not listed and I think uh, that's why you have to sometimes look a bit outside the box and advocate not just for the rarest species but uh, for species that are common or that are declining rapidly um, or just species that are threatened in a small area some piece you know an important uh, population maybe in a in a very localized situation so yeah i would strongly uh, i like that question and we should be we should be designing for the community the natural community <clears throat> as much as individual populations even if 
the species listing is what often drives the requirement um, where development mitigation is involved. Well, thanks for that question, Stephanie. Um, next, Anne would like to know, how do you keep snakes from climbing back onto the road in a slotted culvert design? In a slotted, sorry. Is she oh, yeah. in a slotted culvert design? Do you oh, want- Oh yeah, I get that, okay. <clears throat> well, probably you can't. I've not come across that happening. But um, it's uh, it's a good question. Um, we we have snakes gone through going through there. I guess the cameras wouldn't necessarily pick it up if they popped out in the middle of the road. Those um, slotted passages tend to be used for narrower roads. Um, but uh, yeah, it could happen. So good good question. Don't know the answer. Well, and there you go. <laughs> you can try to figure it out near you. <laughs> um, and we're going to, she said, she gave us a thumbs up. <laughs> um, and so just to jump back a bit to the flow, the water flow question, um, is the BMP for the trenches that you mentioned, is that on that Caltrans website as well? Or is it it's a separate the document? document? The, the, yeah. The, yeah, the BMP, the best practice manual, Best management practices is a uh, hundred and twenty pages. I think it's there's a lot, lot more detail. Most of my slides were plucked out of it, but you'll find that too much there. To it's, it's a it's a it's a very detailed document. So um, I'm not sure that's illustrated, but the, the point is covered uh, quite clearly. I hope. Yeah. So yeah, like we said, we'll post it on the CHS webpage. Uh, people are saying thank you. Great points. I'm out of questions. If you want, you can unmute yourself if you have a question or type another one in the chat. Um, but thank you so much, Tom. This is so interesting and so thorough. I think it'll be really useful for a lot of us as well. Getting more thank yous. Yeah, it was great to have the opportunity to to share some of this information. It's been a long time in in making and. Uh, I hope you can use it to good effect. We get, I have to say on the on the water side, we the things that I get to hear about is the massive problem with snow uh, sitting on fences in, in Canada and snow plows coming through and trashing everything, placing massive load on top of, of barriers. So maybe that's an area where um, strong, really strong guide walls are needed rather than stand up fences. Um, but uh, yeah, your, your weather can be fairly extreme from sort of huge snow drifts down to some quite hot weather, I guess. So you've really got a testing environment to, uh, to work with. Yep, we do. We've actually heard from people in the society that they are having those problems. So um, hopefully it can be different to the deserts where everything is so hot and dry, you, you know, it's quite a quite a challenge for the uh, engineers to get the right materials that will stand up for 30, 50, 100 years. Um, and, and it all needs working out. So there's a great opportunities for biologists who want to get into this area and you're going to be short of topics and uh, study. And there's a lot of great people working on it already. who have been mentioned and they, there's a need for more people. So make it a career. Agreed. Uh, we have one more question from David. Uh, do you have any experience dealing with ATVers, uh, people using ATVs in areas with wildlife fencing? Well, ATVs are a terrible nuisance, um, particularly in the desert region. And uh, yeah, just, just everywhere. You just see more and more of it. And it's very depressing and very sad. Uh, like everything, litter, more livestock releases. Um, there's no end to the problems as human populations get bigger and, and recreational devices seem to get more and more uh, frequent. And um, so um, 
we, we used to have motorbikes using the fences, the one-way fences as ramps. I thought that was great fun. Um, and used to smash the fences like that. So, yeah, I don't know um, what you can do about that. I think it just comes down to gate posting and what we call dragon's teeth, which is putting posts in the ground, critical entrance points. Um, um. And Tara's got another question. What about, uh, have you noted any poaching as a result of the culvert or directional fencing? Is that poaching in terms of um, uh, predator? Um, um, I believe or, or it's, more, I, th I believe it's more people taking them, but uh, Tara, okay. you yeah. can clarify if you'd like. For sure, it's a risk. Uh, it's a risk and, um, you know, we have cameras stolen, so why not, uh, why not animals? Uh, as with increased predation by um, introduced predators who sometimes sit and wait by passages, these all have to be looked at and uh, considered um, for sure. I think generally speaking, if anybody really wants to poach animals, they'll do it. Um, and um, I think it's a, it's a, I think it's another, I don't know. I think it's a worry, but it's never been, we never had a case where someone's seen it. So until that happens, I suppose people will imagine it doesn't happen. Um, but it's a good point. And, uh, all this publicity sometimes that surrounds crossings may well bring some sad people to do that. I don't, I don't know. Um, I think these days you can get access to maps of distribution of animals so easily. And on social media, you can find out locations where animals can be seen. So maybe they wouldn't need to bother to go to a, a passage. But in the old days, we used to keep sites secret. And, you know, there used to be a sort of uh, almost a code of, of uh, not giving away places. But that seems to have disappeared. And um, I always thought of it as a bad thing that it was disappearing. But I don't know. Hopefully people will get more interested in looking at these animals in the wild and rather than keeping them, you know, in the tank at home, which seems a bit of a uh, kind of second best to actually enjoying them out in the wild. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got, yeah, Tara's adding in, it was human poaching she was talking about and that it yeah. has been observed in Ontario. Um, but I also know, yeah. Um, the thing about it, people do collect to feed their other, so they'll collect commoner species to feed to their um, to their pet animals. Um, I have heard of that from nature reserves. You know, people going around and hoovering up lizards and snakes to feed to uh, captive exotic snakes. So, yeah, what can you do? You can put up cameras, maybe try and catch them doing it. Um, Yeah, and I, I know in Ontario as well, the number of crossings up, we have um, towards Sudbury, sort of central Ontario, there is a lot of fencing and an overpass and the cross and the underpasses have so few crossings of turtles that it doesn't make sense to have poaching there because they'd aggregate in other places. But I guess something we all need to keep working on. Um, so I think, this is everything. Thank you, everyone, for all your questions. Thank you, Tom, for your time. Um, and Pam, was there anything else? Uh, links will go up on the web page. Our next Herp Hangout is April 14th at noon Eastern.